I'll tell you what, God, sure, he's a lot better to us than we are to him. It amazes me how God continues to bless and not curse. We'll let him. He'll bless us beyond measure. But he's not going to bless and fill a dirty cup. He likes to use clean vessels. Is that Miss Doris back there? I thought you were going away. <laughs> she can't hear. That's all right. I can say anything I want to. <laughs> Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 22 with me. Luke chapter 22. That's on page 1108 if you have an old Schofield Bible. Luke chapter 22. And look about verse 31. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank and praise you today for the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the good service we had this morning and the way the Spirit of God showed up. But, Lord, we're a needy people, God, and we need you here tonight again, one more time. And I pray that anointing might fall down upon this message, upon your messenger, Lord. And, God, I pray that, Lord, you might give us something from the Word of God that we can apply to our lives. That, God, may help us to be better fit to serve you and to live for you in this ungodly world. And Father, I pray now that you would just have your perfect will accomplished here tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to preach a message, if you want to put a title to it, on the devil's third degree. Now, the Bible tells us over in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And the Lord was warning Peter here about what was going to happen in the near future. And Peter didn't understand it, I don't think, at the time. He said, man, he said, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to, to die with you if I have to. I mean, that's how he wanted to follow after Christ. Now, the devil is sifting and devouring teenagers, churches, and homes today. I mean, you can see it. There's even in this church, there's folks here that should be here tonight, and they're not. You know why? Because they're letting the devil have the victory in their lives. But you got to notice the text here. Turn back over to uh, chapter 22 in the same chapter, but look at verse 24. It says, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Now, my philosophy, and let me, I'll share some things with you. My philosophy on leading this church is I'm not going to do anything until God puts it on me to do it. Whatever position needs to be filled or whatever, God is going to have to impress that on my heart and my mind. And they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. See, if you start getting ahead of God on something, it don't make no difference what you think or what I think. It's what thus saith the Lord that makes a difference. To give you an example of that, when I first got saved, and I'd have been saved, I guess, two or three years, something like that, and... And I, I got in this book, 
I studied this book. I mean, when I got home from work, that's all I did was I got in this Bible and I'd spend two, three hours every night. I listened to every preacher, every cassette tape. I had stacks of Peter Ruckman's tapes. I, I wore three tape players out listening to him, his teaching. And I was getting all of this in, but I wasn't even teaching a Sunday school class. And I kept saying, Lord, I says, what, what are you doing all this for? Not knowing what I was, he had in mind for me. I, I think if I'd have known, I'd have stuck my head in the ground. I'd have found me a hole somewhere. But you got to wait on the Lord. Just be patient. Let God open the doors, and God will open those doors for you, and you'll know it's God. But see, there was a strife going on. It says uh, that they want to know who among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. In verse 25 it says, And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth. Is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. Jesus had a servant's heart. And that's what we need to strive to be as servants of the Lord and let God do the promoting. Verse 28 says, Ye are they which have com continued with me in my temptations, and I appointed unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That seems like that's a pretty good place to be at for them. I mean, they're going to be judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But then the Lord, after he said all that, he looked at Peter, and the Lord said unto Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. If a man will not live for God, God turns him over to the devil. I've seen it happen time and time again. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5 is a good example of it. It says, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of, Jesus, of, of the Lord Jesus. Now the devil has three degrees that he uses on man today. First of all, the first one is getting man to sin. That's an easy thing to do because we're sinners. So, I mean, if you're saved, you're a saved sinner. If you're lost, you're a lost sinner. But we're all sinners. Now, the, the devil, he beautifies sin in order to get man to sin. Oh, it looks good. There can't be anything wrong with this because it looks so good. Think about Eve. She saw that the food was good to eat on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was good to look at, and it was a tree desired to make one wise. Think about the prodigal son. He saw the far country, and he said, Man, that looks so good. Daddy, I want to get everything you owe me for working all these years, my inheritance, and I'm going to go to the far country, and I'm going to be my own boss. We know how that come out for him. Pretty bad. Wound up in the hog pen. Now think about Jesus Christ himself. He was tempted 40 days by the devil himself. That was after he fasted 40 days. 
But then he was tempted. The devil didn't tempt him, I think, 40 days. But he had fasted. He was at the weakest point in his life, not eating for 40 days. And the first thing is this, uh, hey, Jesus, are you hungry? Why don't you turn these rocks into bread? You know, every time the devil confronted him to tempt him, he responded by quoting the Word of God. Amen. See, that's why I keep saying it's the Word of God that does it. It's the Word of God that guides us into all truth through the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God that strengthens our faith. It's the Word of God that is most powerful that we can use to see people getting saved. Amen. And the devil knows that. And if he can get our eyes off of the Word, now, the devil has always wanted man to sin. you got to understand that when, when God created Adam and placed him in the Garden of Eden, it was a perfect creation, and God had to restore some things that got messed up. See, in the beginning, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God didn't create the heaven and the earth void and without form. He created it beautiful and if you'll start studying your Bible, you'll understand that the devil had a kingdom down here. He was known as the king of Tyre, and he lost that kingdom when he rebelled against God when he said, I will put my throne above the throne of God. Now see, he had a throne. He was a king, and he, had the, he was the king of the whole creation of this earth. He lost that. Why do you think he came to Eve and to Adam and he tempted them? He wanted them to sin. And see, anytime you disobey the word of God, you sin. The thought of foolishness, the Bible says, is sin. So the devil has ways, has always wanted a man to sin. How about love of self? A proud heart and a haughty look. Man, when you... See, the Bible says, when a man thinketh he standeth, let him take heed lest he fall. I have arrived. I'm the best thing that ever happened to this church. That's the wrong attitude. When you have a proud heart and a haughty look in a, in a, about you, you're, you're messed up. How about the love of money? The devil uses that a lot. People get caught up in getting rich. You need to be rich in the things of God in this world. I'm, I'm not saying you don't need to make a living, don't get me wrong, but when you put your whole effort and you can do that, put everything you got into becoming rich. You've got to dedicate yourself to that. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort, but just think of the time you're taking away from God and serving Him and living for Him when you're like that. See, the devil tries to get you sidetracked. See, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And the devil knows that. And he knows that he can get man to start loving that money, and that is the root of all evil. It's leading men to hell today because that's their whole, their whole mindset is to make more money to be something in this world. How about the love of pleasure? In 2 Timothy 3, 4, the Bible says, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You look at all the people that's in football games around today. You start comparing that to the number of people in church, there's a, that's a sad, sad thing. I wonder what God thinks about all this. How about getting men to try to cover their sin? You know, remember Adam and Eve when they heard God? God says, where art thou, Adam? Where art thou? And Adam says, well, after he called several times, he said, well, here we are. He says, what would you hide for, Adam? Well, we were naked. Well, who told you that you were naked? I mean, God already knew all this. He said, he said, have you partaken of the tree that I told you not to partake of, the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And Adam had to bow his head and he said, yes, sir. <laughs> and God chased him. Did I say something wrong? Oh. 
Ja. Oh. I'm, try, I'm trying to be nice here. Y'all make it hard. How about Cain? He covered up his sin by saying, am I my brother's keeper? I mean, do I need to know where he is all the time and what he's up to all the time? God had him dead to rights. He said, the blood of Cain, or Abel, is crying to me from the ground. He put a mark on him and chased him out of the whole country there. How about Ahab and Jezebel? They hid their sin legally. That was a wicked couple there, man. They used the law. You, you can see that going on today. You know, this, <laughs> this stuff going on up there about, about trying to appoint that Supreme Court justice and all the hearings and stuff, them people up there that's trying to judge him and figure out whether he's good enough to be there is probably some of the most wicked people there is in the world. That's the biggest farce I've ever seen in my life. What it is, all of those liberals don't want a conservative judge in there. That's the bottom line. And that's about as political as I'll get. How about Achan? He, did, he saw and he lusted after the, the stuff that he saw there. And he hid it under his tent. I wonder how that worked out for him. Well, they took him out and stoned him. There's a big pile of rocks right there where they stoned him and his wife and his kids and his cat and his dog and everything, man. You know, getting men to die in their sin is the devil's greatest desire. And it broke my heart this morning. There were some folks here that really, I believe, was under conviction and they would not act on it. You know, when you get under conviction and the Holy Spirit of God starts working on you, God's got those blockades up to try to keep you out of hell. And when you start rejecting what God's put up there for you to keep you out of hell, God just removes them. And then it's easy to fall right into the pits of hell. In John chapter 8 and verse 21, it says, Then Jesus, or then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me. And shall die in your sins, whether I go, ye cannot come. See, he's saying to these folks here, these talking about these religious people, they're going to die in their sin. See, Jesus made a way to have that sin taken away. John the Baptist, in John chapter 1, verse 29, when he saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He came to this world for one reason, and that was to seek and to save that which is lost. And when mankind rejects what God's doing for them, God pulls his hand off of them. He removes those blockades, and that way to hell is a broad way. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. The devil wants you, first of all, to miss heaven if you're lost. In John 14, 5 and 6, Thomas saith, saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Then Jesus said, I am, uh, said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, Thomas said, man... How do, we don't know how to get to heaven. Jesus said, look, Thomas. And who is Thomas? He's the one that missed Sunday night service and missed the, when the Lord showed up. I tell you, you stay home on Sunday night, you don't ever know what's going to happen. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ himself could come walking through them doors. I believe that's when the rapture is going to take place too. Sunday night. Sorry, people sitting home and they ought to be in church worshiping God. Amen. You know, it gets me, no offense to nobody, but it gets me to having a church that don't even have Wednesday and Sunday night service anymore. Amen. Oh, we can't afford to run the electric uh, because uh, there ain't enough of people here to, to justify it. 
My Bible says something about how many, two or three, are gathered in my name. There will I be in the midst also. I tell you what, when God's on the scene and God comes, it don't make no difference how many people you got there. You got the majority already. Amen. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Amen. The devil wants everybody to suffer the second death. See, the devil's going to be cast into the lake of fire and he knows it and he wants everybody that there he can possibly get to go with him. And then some idiot will say, well, that's where I want to go. All my friends are going to be there. We're going to have a big party. I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't call that a party screaming and gnashing the teeth, man. That don't sound like fun to me. I mean, being on fire but not being consumed, you still have a body like this one almost that it's got... It, but it won't be destroyed by fire, but it's got all the nerve endings on it, and you're going to be suffering, you're going to be burning, or you're going to be screaming and gnashing the teeth all the time, yeah. utter darkness. I, I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. The devil has an eternal death bid on you if you're lost. Revelation 21, 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, you know, there were some, there were some weird characters mentioned here. I mean, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. I've never seen so many liars in my life. I hate, and that's a strong word, I hate a liar. Amen. If somebody will lie to you, they'll do anything else. They'll fit in every one of those other categories. That's why God included and all liars hmm, shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. They're going to be tormented by Satan. Revelation 20, 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, and that is where the devil is. I can't wait to that great white throne judgment. Whenever God goes up there and he gets that devil, and see the beast and the false prophet are already there, He's going to take that devil by the nap of the neck and he said this is going to be the final destination for you forever. And he's going to hold him out over there and there's going to be a shout in heaven when he goes Psst, and you see him drop into that lake of fire. He don't like that. That's why the, Jesus told Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, said the devil, Satan hath desired to have you and to sift you as wheat. You ever seen them or read account of them how they sift wheat? They got these baskets. And there was, they'd get up on a knoll or a hill or something where the breeze was blowing and they'd take the, the, the grain and, and the chaff that was in it and throw it up in the air and the wind would blow the chaff away and then the, the grain and stuff would fall back down. They'd keep doing that till all of it. And that's how the devil wants to do us, just kind of keep throwing us up in the air. See, that's why the Bible says we need to be grounded. We need to be settled. We need to be established in the faith. You can only do that by being faithful to God, coming to church and reading this book and studying it. The devil does his best. He gives it all. He gives, does his best to send men and women and boys and girls to hell. He's a wicked, wicked creature. And we're not ignorant of his devices. 
But guess what? We fall for them all the time, don't we? We need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. That word sober means clear-minded. Be vigilant. We are need to be on guard duty because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, I don't know, have you, ever, have you ever been out and heard a lion roar out in the jungle? I was talking to one of our missionaries one time, and he's from Africa. He's African. and I said, brother, I says, uh, what do you do when you hear a lion roaring over here? I said, do you run? He said, nope. He said, you climb a tree. He said, because if you hear a lion roar over here, your natural instinct is going to run from that noise going this way. And there's usually three or four lions over there hiding, ready to ju jump on you. So when you hear a lion roaring up here, climb the nearest tree. And I'd want to find me a high, big tree. Because I believe them lions probably can climb trees. I don't know. With my luck, I would find one that could. But I tell you what, you know, the devil, it says, as a roaring lion. As. He's just as fearful or fearless. He's just as mean as he can be, as a lion can be. Because when he's, when he's after you, he's on your trail. I guarantee you. See, that's why Jesus warned Peter. Because he said, look, Satan hath desired to have you and to sift you as wheat. But you know what the best part of that I like? Verse 32, it says, but I've prayed for thee Amen. that thy faith fail not. We need to be praying one for another. Jesus is praying for us. But we need to pray one for another. And we need, like I said, you keep your eyes and your nose in this book. And you won't have a whole lot of trouble. I mean, you have some trouble, but you won't have no problem living for the Lord. They'll, God will put something inside of you that will constrain you. That will help you along the way. And that's what every one of us, we need to be on guard. We need to be aware of what the devil tries to do. He'll try to get you discouraged. Well, things ain't going right around here and all this stuff here. I think I'm just going to go look somewhere else. You know, I've heard that before. I've had people say, well, I'm going to go to another church that I'm just not getting fed here. <laughs> Makes me want to grab them and shake them till their eyeballs rattle. Amen. <laughs> if you ain't getting nothing from God here, honey, you ain't going to get nothing from God somewhere else, I guarantee you, because God, you, you got to have a clean cup for God to give you something. And that's the problem is you've got strife and you've got uh, whatever it is in your heart and your mind that's keeping you from receiving the blessings of God. I like that song. I need to get my wife to sing that one of these days, Drinking from the Saucer. You know, you, when your cup runs over, Got a saucer. You know why they, you know why you use saucers with cups? They don't do it hardly anymore. Well, when you spill something, that saucer catches it, and then you can pick that saucer up and drink it. You don't waste nothing. My granddaddy, I never will forget him sitting there eating supper, and he'd get a cup of coffee and have my grandma put a. That's my mama's mama and dad. He'd put a coffee cup up there, and he'd take that cup and just turn it up like that and put it in the saucer, and that would cool it off, and then he'd pick it up and drink it out of that. Yep. He, always, he also ate English peas with a knife. Yep. He would take his fork and rake it up on the knife and go, Quick. I was so amazed as a kid at that. <laughs> I tried that, and I poked myself in the lip every time. <laughs> I learned not to use a sharp knife. Well, kids ain't too bright sometimes. You got to learn the hard way, right? Sometimes. But don't ever forget that the devil hath desired to have you. 
and to sift you as wheat. And if we're just taking, do what God wants us to do. See, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And remember what Jesus said, Peter? He said, but I prayed for you. Man, I tell you what, I can't imagine. I don't know how I'd get by without Jesus praying for me. And same way you. And, we, you know, we, we need to pray one for another. And it, it, it just blesses my heart when somebody will, I'll have a preacher text me or somebody, one of y'all call me up and say, Preacher, I've been praying for you today. I said, praise the Lord. And I had a lady, I've said, I ain't said this in a long time, I had a lady I went to visit, she's come to church, she's gone home to be with the Lord now, but she lived over in one of these trailer parks over there, Windmill Village or one of them, and I went to visit them, and I was talking to her, and there was a jet went over, kind of shook her house a little bit, you know, or she lived in a little trailer, and she said, Preacher, you hear that jet up there? And I said, Yes, ma'am. She said, Well, Every time I hear a plane or a jet or anything, a helicopter or anything go over, I pray for you. And then I got to listening to different, how many planes go over. I mean, not a whole bunch, but every now and then you'll hear a bunch of them. And I get to thinking, man, every time she hears that, she gets down and prays for me. That's humbling. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, man. You know, Jack Hiles, he mentioned that. I, I heard him in a, one of the bus uh, conventions we went to. He said that in his church, he has a big high platform, and there's like an a, a apartment underneath it they built for a widow lady. And that widow lady, every time he preaches, no matter where it is, she, find, she, she has a list of the times he's going to be preaching. She prays for him the whole time he's preaching. You wonder why the power is not in the pulpits anymore? The people aren't praying. See, when you come to church, you ought to have already prayed, God, put it on that preacher. Bless our hearts here tonight. Come down and meet with us. Show us something from your word. See, you have not because you ask not. How much do you want it? Do you really want revival? You got to ask for it. You got to live like you're expecting it any second. God will give it. You have not because you ask not. We need to start asking. We need to start trusting. You having trouble living for the Lord? Ask Him to help you. Duh. That ain't that ain't that don't take a whole lot of intelligence there. If you're having a hard time living for Jesus, man, say, okay, Lord, I can't do this on my own, but I know you can help me. And the Bible says that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And honey, that means living for him. That means serving him. That means being faithful to him, whatever it is. If you'll ask him, he is all powerful and he is all able to do above what we ask or think. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand to our feet. That's all God give me. Let's have